we're going to take a deep dive now across all of the teams and we're better to start than with the reigning Premier's Collingwood targeted recruiting certainly paid off in winning this year's Premiership and, and they've gone after Lockie Schultz specifically. They haven't had a lot of movement but they they targeted him and they got him and, and that's been one of the biggest stories of this trade period. That's right. So let's rip through the ins and outs for each club. So the Mosquito fleet is absolutely elite. Lockie Schultz comes in as the big name recruit. Jack Ginevan gone, Taylor Adams on the move. Their rivals do very little to improve their lists. Nathan Murphy is about to meet with the AFL in coming weeks in a meeting that could end his career given concussions. Um, but nine players 30 or more next year they won the flag not too many worries guys no and, and look i mean graham right we know how great a job he did 12 months ago and we saw it culminate with bobby hill so now they go and get their man Lockie schultz who's an above average small forward he do both sides of the ball he can hit the scoreboard he's a terrific pressure player um, and he's a link up man so i think they've done really well collingwood 18 home and away wins last year top of the table everyone everyone knew what they were with a month to go they look a little bit wobbly at times but they're a seriously experienced group, and those guys will continue to drive them to another opportunity next year. Schultz goes in as, a, as a, almost another leader in that forward half of the ground. Played a lot of footy, uh, has, has had moments in games when they've been needed. Love those sort of players. Guys, when they, they, they can turn a game for you when it's in the balance, he's another one of those. So they don't miss a beat. They're a happy football club, and why wouldn't they go back to back? I mean, they, there's a heap of clubs sniffing around the edges just behind them, but right now, you'd have to be thrilled with what they've done in the off-season. So, so nine players, 30 plus, um, Penelope House, side bottom Cox, you know, they all start in the finals. But is there an opportunity in those first 10 rounds of the year? We saw um, Melbourne, they went 10 and zip after their Premiership defence. You just bring some of those kids in, whether it's Josh Carmichael or Ash Johnson or uh, Finn McRae, just to make sure that when we do get to the finals again, those boys are absolutely up and running because they were trained to the minute the plus 30s in the grand final. Yeah, and it's a fine line, isn't it? Because you want to have your, your best team to try and, and win it again while you're in the window, of course. But at the same time, filtering through some young talent. And they're probably not stacked in the VFL, like Ed Allen's another one who's played some really good footy, a high-end draft pick. Finn McRae, they believe, you know, is staying because he, he's going to get opportunity next year. So oh, I think they've got to blood these youngsters as well as continue to, to be one of the top teams and, in the competition. Let's not forget, the, the, the leg up the father-son gives Collingwood is enormous. Yep. And <laughs> everyone talks about the other, Nick Dacos and they're polarising their view on him, uh, what sort of player he is. But the bottom line is... He probably should have won the Brownlow this year. He's going to be an elite player in the competition for a long time. So to get that sort of player as a father-son allows you some scope with your list build. And Josh, who's incredible yeah. as well. Yeah, but it does, I mean, you can have some you can have some misses with your picks along the way if you get a bit of father-son love. We talked about the big win Collingwood have had in getting Lockie Schultz. It's a big loss for Fremantle, along with Henry and Hamling. It's going out. What's going on there at the moment? Do we think? It's a tough one. I, I don't know whether I love them or not, uh, Fremantle, because they're, they're stacking a lot of players through the draft. And I had a look at uh, the draft since since 2017. So going back a, a few years, they've got 11 players they've drafted in the top 30. They're the picks that I rate. 1 to 30. Outside of that, it's lucky dip stuff. But they've, they've picked up 11 players over, since 2017, and 10 of them are still on the list. So I, I think they've got a good glut of uh, high-quality players coming through. But I feel like they never really pick a year when they're going to actually be the, be the team. You know, are they building towards two, three years' time where they go all in, free agent, all that sort of... It seems to me like they see, a, they see a Hogan, they go and get him. They see a Jackson, they go and get him. They see a Wilson, they go and get him. They see an Aker. They're forever just tinkering with these, these selections. I'd love them to sit out a couple of years and then just go hard for, for a two- to three-year window. But in saying that... They are, they are stacked for young talent. Well, that's what they will do next year with three first-round picks. So they can really load up yeah. next next year. That probably has been slowed down their rebuild because players do continue to leave. And they're all for different circumstances. Chera wanted to come home, you know, Schultz this year and Liam Henry and, and Blake Akers and those sorts of things. But their list builds in a pretty good shape. They've got some top-end young talent. It sort of got almost overshadowed a little bit, Ralph. They were, they were sort of bottom three in the competition for their age demographic. They weren't that far ahead of Hawthorne, who everyone's talking about is a young rebuilding team. So I think everyone just has to to buy time and be a little bit more patient, but they're certainly on the right track. Yeah, and Sean Darcy will sign a long-term contract. He's a pre-agent now, and so they'll, he'll have to pay absolutely top dollar at Fremantle. I suppose the only thing I would say is Lockie Schultz, they thought he might sign a long-term deal, but everyone in football knew that there were really valid reasons why he might potentially move um, back to Victoria with his partner. So they knew from, well, when I reported it in March that um, Liam Henry was going to be in Victoria. He wanted the bright lights of, of Victoria and Melbourne. And so why was it that they didn't have a, a crack at Tyler Brockman early? West Coast knew, you know, Colin Young was 
was uh, very aware that he might bring his client home, again, for very valid family reasons. So I'm just not sure whether they, they were behind the play or ahead of the play, because all of a sudden now they've got a, a spot where maybe Heath Chapman can play on a wing, another spot at half forward. And having said that, I understand how hard it is to get players to come across to Frio. Brockman was there, you have a crack. I, I think they've got more more issues with the system and getting embedded in this group how they want to play, how they want to win games of football. Not stay in games of football, but win games of football than they have with their, their talent acquisition and their list. Let's move on to the Sydney Swans. Ralphie, what kind of a mark are you giving them for their trading period? Uh, a plus. I think they're one of the big winners or one of the big winners in the top eight. So they get Brody Grundy as the cheapest chips deal, only paying him 600000 Taylor Adams is a heart and soul clearance beast, plus Joel Hamling and James Jordan, both free agents, who they would feel could be in their top 22. They lose Dylan Stevens, but he was a 13 possession a, a game man. I don't think that will hurt him. And they still have pick 12 to go back to the draft. I think it's a seriously impressive period for John Longmire, who absolutely thinks he's in the sweet spot, might have two years to go, and he's going to make use of all of his um, um, trade and free, a uh, free agency levers. They've had concerns around the edges. Ruck's been a concern for them for a little while since Hickey lost that absolute form that he had two, two years ago. Um, and then around the edges, they've, they've looked as wobbly last year as they've ever looked, I think. The core of their group, that midfield, is going to take them a long way. And it's going to take them deep. What they win last year, they won 12 home and away games. So they're probably looking to only win two to three more. So that, those guys that they've brought in can certainly bridge the gap. I think, I think Grundy's an elite ruckman still in the AFL. And he'll give them, as we talked about with Port Adelaide, that first service, that little hit to advantage there. It's only a step. It's only a metre. But look at the ramifications it has in true vision there. You can just see Viney stepping out the front of, of traffic. That'll be Warner. That'll be Parker. I mean, that's so exciting if you're a Sydney Swans uh, supporter. I like Jordan. I think that he's a good depth midfielder. You don't go you don't go back to absolute C grade. You, you're somewhere in the middle there from, from the Parker, Warner, uh, Goulden down to a Jordan. It's not as big as drop as what it has been over the last couple of years for Sydney. So I like what they've done. Yeah, Kenny Beach and his team, a big win. They've targeted specific players and specific needs. We've spoken a lot this year, Kingy, about their contest and their clearance game was really inconsistent and it let them down at crucial times. Now they address that with Taylor Adams and Brodie Grundy. They get the key defender, not their first choice, but they get someone who's a solid, reliable player and I expect a bounce back from the Swans this year. Now the only issue for uh, Sydney from a contract perspective is at Logan McDonald. So Freo and West Coast have already said we'll back up the truck. Freo, I've got three first rounders there. My understanding is he's not likely to sign a contract anytime soon. He wants to see how he can play in a team that doesn't have Buddy Franklin. So Hayden McLean, McDonald or Marty, do they have to kick 60 or 80 goals? But you know, whatever it will be, I think there will be absolutely fever pitch about Logan McDonald and a potential move back west.